So how do you follow up one of the best SummerSlams in years? Well, WWE's answer is to continue the main storylines, add in a few new ones, go back to the tight five-match format, and the hot European crowds. Did it work? Well, this is what I thought of Bash in Berlin. Welcome to Silo Voice Wrestling on YouTube and the Silo Voice Wrestling Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jason C. McLean. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, and of course, ring that bell for notifications to get all my wrestling hot takes, cold takes, simmering takes, assorted thoughts on Raw and SmackDown, wrestling opinion pieces, prediction videos like my Bash in Berlin predictions. Uh, I think I got some of those right. And of course, reviews of WWE Premium Live events. Now, I'm recording this September 7th, 2024 in the afternoon, so I've seen the subsequent Raw and SmackDown. That might color my opinions a little bit, but just so you know when I recorded this. Now, let's get into it. Actually, before we get into it, let's talk about SmackDown that happened right before. Now, as I've noticed, and I think a lot of people have noticed, these SmackDowns, when it's a international or a big PLE, have kind of functioned as the pre-show. Yes, there was an actual pre-show, but this effectively was the in-ring pre-show. And I do want to note two of the things that happened. We had LA Knight with his open challenge for the United States Championship. And just as I predicted, although I did predict it happening on the PLE, his opponent was Ludwig Kaiser because he was from Raw. And it was great. LA Knight came out, got the massive crowd pop. He didn't get booze because nobody knew who he was fighting and he was popular. And then Ludwig Kaiser came out. He got cheers as well, too. Talked in German. Really good match. Of course, LA Knight won, but this really helped to boost Ludwig Kaiser, hometown crowd, and a really good performance against a top babyface. There was also uh, Nia Jax defending the WWE Women's, Women's Championship against Michin in a street fight. It was a fun match. It was a bit messy. There was Michin getting uh, annihilated with the garbage can at the end but of course the the important part was bailey coming in and tiffany stratton coming in actually tiffany stratton came in first you all thought she might cash in and bailey the whole deal it was a fun ending it's setting things up for the future i'm glad we had those two matches but now let's get into the proper bash in berlin card the opener for the undisputed wwe championship the champion the american nightmare cody rhodes defends against challenger kevin owens now, they really increased the setup for this match on SmackDown when the two of these guys met in the ring. Uh, Kevin Owens said that he knew Cody Rhodes' knee was injured. It had been injured on a European house tour circuit. And Cody said, no, it's not injured. Kevin said he sure it was. And that definitely played a part. Match started with a lot of good babyface back and forth. A lot of punches, power moves. Uh, so really intense fighting, but nothing down and dirty. Uh, they shook hands at the beginning. You can see they respected each other. They were just having a wrestling bout, and the crowd was really into it on both sides. I mean, a little bit more for Cody, but they were cheering on KO as well, too. Then the storyline kicked in because at one point uh, KO was down. Cody jumps up to the ropes like a fancy move, but he falls down because, in fact, his knee is hurt. Owens almost takes advantage of it, but then stops himself. He doesn't want to take advantage of the situation and win that way. He doesn't want a tainted victory. On commentary, Wade Barrett is yelling at him, like, come on, KO, like, you know, show, show that killer instinct. Win the match. Uh, Cody eventually gets up. They fight to the outside. At one point, Cody tells him he's fine. So uh, KO said, fine. He does kick the knee. Cody goes down. And he goes to follow it up with an up-the-apron powerbomb from the floor. A devastating move. But then he, he stops himself. No, he's not going to win that way. Wade Barrett's yelling at him again, but no, he's not going to take the easy route. They fight some more in the ring. There are a lot of false finishes, including after some stunners. Eventually, KO goes for a swanton, but Cody gets his knees up. He has the injured knee in the other knee. Cody takes advantage, hits the crossroads. One, two, three. And still your undisputed WWE champion, the American Nightmare Cody Rhodes. After a tense bit, KO gets up and they hug. Now, for my letter grades, this is only I, the second time I've done this, so I don't fully have the system in place yet, knowing exactly what each letter means anyways, but you'll get the idea. So for story, uh, this is A, a solid A. It's a good story. They've uh, built it over the past few weeks. It's not really a long-running story. It's sort of a will he turn or won't he story, so not, not the most original story, uh, nothing like Wow, this is incredible. Best in year, but decent, good, solid. A. 
As for in-ring storytelling, though, A+, plus, mainly for Kevin Owens, they told the story of the injured knee and whether or not a KO was going to take advantage of it or whether or not KO was going to turn and win as a heel or have a fair fight as a bit. They, they did that perfectly. That was excellent. Um, as for in-ring work, A-, minus. I mean, it was good. It was solid. Nothing to complain about. Uh, it wasn't anything that spectacular, especially from these guys. They're always both very good. Uh, so solid. Um, and of course, audience reaction. Well, it's A+, plus, but honestly, a little spoiler alert, all of the matches on this show, the audience reaction is A+. Plus. This was a really hot crowd. This is an incredible crowd. So yeah, overall uh, feel for this match, I'm going to give it an A. It was a very good match to start off the show with. Uh, in fact, I think it was definitely one of the better matches on the show. Um, I loved how they wove this thread of KO possibly uh, turning on Cody or even being a little bit of a heel throughout the match and his indecision. The performance was excellent. The crowd was working with both competitors and it got over really well. It uh, set it up. Uh, KO still top babyface and uh, Cody if Orton eventually does turn on him, Orton's going to look like that much more of a heel because KO didn't turn on him. It's, it's, this is, this is excellent wrestling storytelling and performance. Again, solid A to start off the show. Next up for the WWE Women's Championships, the champions, the unholy union of Alba Fire and Isla Dawn versus challengers and former champions, Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill. Okay, I'll be honest. I, Going into this, I sort of saw it as the quantum leap match, the uh, putting right what once went wrong match. What went wrong was the interruption of the dominant streak of Bianca and Jade as tag team champions, and then secondly, them not winning it back on that SmackDown. But you know what? I've had some time to think about it, and I'm kind of glad things went the way they did. It actually gives more importance to the tag team championships. The match was fast-paced with a lot of back and forth. Bianca got in trouble. Her hair was used as a weapon both against and for her, but ultimately she looked very strong. Jade, of course, had the aura and the power moves, but looked consistently good in this match, much improved since her debut. At one point, though, Jade was prevented from hot tagging in. Thanks to Alba Fire, uh, uh, Bianca was picking up Alba, and Alba did a tornado DDT, and in the process of it, kicked Jade off the apron. Alba was quite impressive. Actually, uh, the Unholy Union showed why they did deserve to have the tag team championships for as long as they did. But of course, it ended with a spine buster German suplex combination. Jade got the pin. One, two, three. And new WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill. Fun fact, the uh, WWE Women's Tag Team Championships only change hands and always change hands when defended in Europe. Think about it. It wasn't WrestleMania where Bianca and Jade won them. It was at uh, Backlash in Lyon, France, where they beat Damage Control to first take the titles. They lost them to Fire and Dawn in the triple threat match that also involved Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark at Clash at the Castle in Glasgow, Scotland. And now they won them back at the Bash in Berlin in Germany. Maybe they'll lose them again. Uh, the next uh, PLE in, in Europe. I don't know if there's going to be one before WrestleMania. Honestly, I'm pretty sure they're going to keep these titles, be dominant champions, maybe have a few near losses, but only ultimately lose them when they turn on each other and then fight each other in WrestleMania, a singles match. And if there's a championship, a singles championship involved, it might even be a main event. But that's the future. Let's go back. Um, let's go back to the present or the I guess the recent past. Okay, for this match, um, for the story, I'm going to give it a B. It's a good story. I mean, it's kind of a basic story. It's um, uh, basically they lost the championships without ever being pinned or submitted, even though Jade actually did, but that wasn't seen. And eventually they were screwed out of it, and then they eventually get them back. So decent story. Um, as far as the in-ring storytelling, also a B. Can't really complain. They, they did it very well. Um, it was clear what was happening. Good performances, but um, not too much of the physical storytelling. Um, as far as uh, the match quality, 
I'm going to say A minus. This is, I think, one of the better matches I've seen with uh, Jade and Cargill. Uh, Jade got the, uh, sorry, Jade and Bianca. Jade is Jade Cargill, yeah. Uh, Jade got those amazing power moves in, had the whole aura, had all that, but also was a lot more consistent in this match. Bianca was her usual great self, and uh, there were some really interesting high spots. And uh, the Unholy Union uh, were quite good as well, too. And, of course, audience reaction A+, plus as it is for every match on this. Overall, I did like this match. Not my favorite match. Um, I'm going to give it a B. Solid B. Good match. Good way for them to win the tag team titles back. I didn't absolutely need this match, but I'm glad it was there. Next up, the strap match between Drew McIntyre and CM Punk. Samantha Irvin explained the rules very well. Basically, a, you had, your two opponents were attached by a strap. They had to touch each of the four turnbuckles in sequence. Every time you touch a turnbuckle, your light goes off. And, but if your opponent gets an offensive move in on you, it, you have to go back to the start. Drew had red light. Uh, CM Punk had the green light. I could see CM Punk's light. I was having trouble seeing Drew's light. I'm partially colorblind. But still, I could see when they touched the turnbuckle. Anyways, so the uh, the introductions. Uh, but then before they could even get the strap on, Drew attacked Punk. There was a spot on the table. Eventually, they were both strapped up. There were some typical strap spots, like pulling each other into turnbuckles, things like that. Punk had tried to set up a table. Drew put it away to boost from the crowd. Punk pulled it back. Later in the match, Punk went through the table. Drew made the first round of the turnbuckles. At this point, they did what I've uh, learned was a classic territory spot in strap matches where the heel would hit the turnbuckle, the babyface being carried around would hit the turnbuckle after him uh, and eventually end up winning the match that way. That was That's usually been a finish in the territories. Apparently, it wasn't a finish here, um, but it was the spot. They did the spot. At one point, Drew had Punk down and he pulled out the friendship bracelet from his trunks. He put it on, but Punk took control, hit the go to sleep. Then he hit the first turnbuckle. Drag Drew to the next one, did another go to sleep, hit the turnbuckle. Drag Drew to the next one, hit another go to sleep, hit the turnbuckle. He was going to go for the fourth turnbuckle, but he noticed the bracelet. He hit another go to sleep. He noticed the last turnbuckle, but then he also noticed the bracelet. Took off the bracelet, put it on, tap the turnbuckle. Your winner, CM Punk, and the new holder of the bracelet, CM Punk, stood over Drew McIntyre. Okay, this is the feud of the year. Uh, this is definitely one of the peaks of it. Um, as far as pushing the story forward or overall story, it gets an A. Uh, I won't exactly go to A plus for that. It gets an A. Uh, a plus for in ring storytelling. I mean, wow, this was this was a, a master class in in ring storytelling. Uh, match quality A plus. Of course, crowd reaction A plus as well too. Overall, it gets an A plus. Um, now, like I said, this is feud of the uh, of the year. Uh, this is the second act of the three-act play. Obviously, the third act is going to be, well, I've seen Raw, so I know that it didn't just end, although it kind of had a little ending here. Uh, the third part is going to be uh, at uh, Bad Blood, maybe a Hell in the Cell. Pretty sure that's where we were going for. Then maybe can, Punk can go on to Gunther or someone else, or Drew could go on. Whatever. Well, uh I like the use of the bracelet in this match. Uh, <laughs> Drew pulled it out of his trunks and then Punk kissed it and put it on. I, maybe he didn't see where it came from. Anyways, regardless, it was definitely used. It was definitely important, but Punk didn't fall for the trap. And I almost thought he was going to lose because of the bracelet, but no, he didn't. He won. He resoundingly beat Drew McIntyre, which of course really pissed Drew off. Uh, Punk's first televised match back match win since he came back. He did win some house mass matches against Dominic Mysterio. Uh, but anyways, this was a good way to do it. It reminds us that CM Punk uh, is not over the hill, is a is the big star that he deserves to be for in-ring work as well as for his uh, mic skills and all that. This is definitely a candidate for my match of the night, but so was the next one. Representing the Judgment Day, the women's world champion Liv Morgan and Dirty Dominic Mysterio versus the uh, newly dubbed Terror Twins, Rhea Ripley and Damian Priest. With a number of the matches on this card, um, both participants, uh, the babyface, the heel, the situational babyface, what have you, 
got cheers or the heels didn't really get that many boos except for maybe drew but in this case it was absolutely clear who the crowd was behind and who they definitely weren't dom and Liv came out to judgment day music some fog and a massive chorus of boos it was a great heel entrance damian priest got a great crowd pop but it got even bigger when rhea ripley's music hit they started off strong we've got out of there quickly it was lovey dovey with her man thanking him for uh taking her spot and taking a beating from Damian Priest, but he did get some offense in. A funny spot where he's alone with Rhea and he's pleading. She clotheslines him, chokes him out on the rope like she did back when he was a babyface with Ray. Liv comes in, gets some offense in. So does Priest. The Terror Twins had a really nice double razor's edge on the heels. Dom and Liv got some heat back when the other Judgment Day members interfered. Priest took out Dom on the announce table and Rhea hit the Riptide and pinned Liv. Okay, my grading is going to be the same pretty much as the last match for different reasons. Yeah, this is also one of the biggest stories going. Uh, given where we are in the story, though, an A, uh, in-ring storytelling, A+, plus, uh, just the, the whole Dom and Rhea part, for that alone, an A+, plus, but especially the stuff with Liv, it also made total sense how uh, Dominic Mysterio and Liv Morgan were able at any point to have the upper hand on Damian Priest and uh, Rhea Ripley, who are much bigger and much stronger than both of them. But as with the interference or with the the heel tactics they used, it made perfect sense. Uh, match quality, also an A+. I mean, this is like an A-plus in agenting, too. There were so many moving parts at one point. Everything made sense. Even how the ref missed all the cheating. Like, you can see his back's turned. All the stuff's going on behind him. Uh, I don't know if we use this term in wrestling, but the choreography on this was was excellent. Uh, and, of course, A plus for uh, crowd reaction like it is on all the other matches. So this and the last match are definitely uh, rivals for my match of the night. When I made my prediction for this uh, uh, for this match, I thought it was I thought the Terror Twins were going to win, but I thought it was going to end with Damian Priest pinning Dominic Mysterio, but it makes so much more sense that it's Rhea Ripley pinning Liv Morgan because Rhea, uh, Liv is the champion. Rhea already lost her title match by pinning the champion in the non-title match. Uh, it it makes her effectively the number one contender. So now she can demand uh, a rematch with Liv Morgan where hopefully she'll win. Uh, I don't know how long they're going to stretch this story. Maybe they'll stretch it to WrestleMania. Maybe it'll be a bad blood. Survivor Series... I don't know. I'm I'm loving this story. Uh, all the participants involved in this, uh, from the people agenting backstage to the people in the ring, did an excellent job. A truly excellent match. And finally, the main event for the World Heavyweight Championship. The champion, the ring general, Gunther, defending against challenger Randy Orton. Orton came to the ring with the Berlin fans singing his song. Gunther came to the ring with an even bigger babyface pop. There was a fun bit at the beginning uh, during the introduction. Samantha Irvin introduces Randy Orton. Uh, she goes for her Gunther introduction, but Ludwig Kaiser puts his hand out, takes the microphone, talks in German, does his usual Gunther intro in English. Massive cheers. I thought this was great for the crowd, except I really missed hearing Samantha Irvin introduce Gunther. There was, of course, the obligatory chop fest and a lot of back and forth at the start. The crowd was really into it, uh, cheering for both guys. Uh, really enjoying themselves too. At one point, they started the wave, and Orton waited for it to come around and joined in too. I think that's the first time I've ever seen a uh, uh, in-ring wrestler participate in the wave. Of course, the announcers didn't acknowledge it. There's probably still a rule against that, but it was a great scene. They did acknowledge the amazing scene at that point. When Orton hit the draping DDT, the crowd started chanting for the RKO. They cheered when uh, Gunther got offense too. Eventually, they did get to see an RKO, but it didn't end the ring general. Near the end, Orton set up the ring steps and used it to powerbomb Gunther through the announce table, which finally broke. But eventually, Gunther got the sleeper. Orton passed out. And still world heavyweight champion, Gunther. And Gunther and Orton shook hands. For story, I have to give this one a B-. minus. It started off well... Uh, Blinking in what happened at the King of the Ring with uh, Gunther not really pinning Orton. Then it got a bit personal, which is fine, but they didn't continue that. Uh, Gunther later on Raw tried to explain why he did that. But by the time they got to Germany and they revealed, uh, well, I guess in the kickoff that uh, 
Uh, Orton also had some German ancestry. The fact that the crowd was on both their sides, they dropped the personal thing, which I guess made sense, but it made the storytelling a little bit uneven. Uh, but it was still good. So yeah, a B minus. Uh, for the in-ring storytelling, I'm going to go with uh, A minus. And for uh, match quality, solid A. I mean, it, I, maybe go to A, but it was a solid A. It was uh, obviously a good performance from both these guys. I have seen each of them do a bit better, but yeah, still a solid A. And of course, A plus for uh, crowd reaction. Overall, I'm going to give this match an A minus. Uh, now, my take might be a little different if I was in uh, the uh, the Uber Arena in Berlin. If I was, uh, I mean, obviously it was the main event specifically for the local crowd, which made perfect sense. I did like the Cody and uh, KO match a little bit more, and uh, uh, my two favorite matches are, of course, tied. Uh, Judgment Day versus Terra Twins and CM Punk uh, versus Drew McIntyre, the strap match. But still, this was a good main event. This was a solid match. I'm glad I saw it. And that's my review of WWE's Bash in Berlin. To recap, uh, Cody and KO gets an A. Uh, Bianca Belair, Jade Cargill versus the Unholy Union gets a B. Uh, CM Punk versus Drew McIntyre, strap match. And uh, Terror Twins versus Judgment Day each get an A+. They're tied for my match of the night. And Gunther, Randy Orton gets an A-. Overall, I thought this was an excellent, well-paced show. I love these five-match shows. Uh, I understand why you have to have more in the bigger events, but this was, this was a show that did exactly what it needed to do. It followed up SummerSlam. It progressed the storylines, and I'm very excited for the next one. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with some of my takes? All of my takes? None of my takes? Do you agree with my whole kind of haphazard uh, grading system? Let me know in the comments. Follow at Silo Wrestling on X, at Silo Voice Wrestling on Instagram and Facebook, and me at Jason C. McLean on X and Instagram. And of course, make sure you like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. I will catch you next time for Silo Voice Studios in Montreal. I'm Jason C. McLean.